My name is Matthew Copeland. I'm a curator. And as a curator, I've always been obsessed and uh, fascinated by what exhibitions can be, what are the limits of exhibitions. And I guess for the past nearly 20 years now, I've really been thinking about that, working with this um, with this query question in mind. Really, what, what exhibitions are, what can they be, and how? what are the limits, if there are any limits to them. So the exhibition is called Exhibition Cuttings, and it's really articulated around, I'd say two, even though it's one exhibition, it's articulated around two exhibitions, so to say, which is the first one here in, this, in the space where we are in right now, it's called Nurturing Exhibitions. And the um, other space is literally an exhibition cutting, as much as it's a documentary film that stems from an exhibition that I previously did back in 2016. And so what was interesting about thinking of exhibition here for the Amnesty Foundation was trying to understand what would it be to um, yes, literally to nurture an exhibition, to make an exhibition grow. When one, as a curator, when one is invited to think about what exhibitions can be, it really starts about, let's let it grow from somewhere. What's the seed there? And the seed was in a discussion that I was having with Reiko Setsuda about a past exhibition of mine, namely a retrospective of closed exhibition, and also linked to another one that I co-curated together with Gustav Metzger, Clive Philpott, John Armeder, and Mathieu Perret called Void's Retrospective. And it was interesting to think about the radicality of these two exhibitions and how literally these became the seeds for our current conversation today and also for our current exhibition as these are now. And so what really came from that was two things. First, my, um, literally, as I said, a cutting of an exhibition, how we could cast a retrospective look upon what has happened, and that what is happening in space B, where you have welcome to experience an exhibition mediated through the form of a film, here a documentary, or rather an anti-documentary. And just to give you um, the, the meanings why, back in 2016, when I curated the perspective of a closed exhibition, what mattered then was to think about how often many artists have seized the gesture of closing the gallery in order to show, in order to make a work of art. And throughout this whole um, history that was coming together, it was all about trying to think how we can experience these gestures anew. Well, fast forward 2020, then we live right in the middle of a pandemic, a global pandemic caused by COVID-19, and the entire institutions all over the world shut down. Even ourselves, we shut down. We were meant to open the exhibition a year ago, and of course it could not happen. We were caught in the spiral the spiral that claims so many lives, unfortunately, and I deplore that. So the um, invitation then to revisit this exhibition by means of a film becomes far deeper in as much as it was also a moment for us to reflect upon the moment that we live in, upon that time where we are. To think about what it means when the gallery, when the museums all over the world have to close, when we have to experience a new form of um, social distancing, when we have to experience everything that it was meant to bring us together and exhibitions and museums and galleries and foundations such as these ones are part of the dialogue, a part of the discourse. But what happens when the discourse is broke down? What happens when we cannot get together anymore? What happens when we have to be kept apart? Like today, I am in London, you are in Tokyo. I wish I was on site here experiencing the space, but I cannot be here, unfortunately. This is just a small token to pay compared to the, as I've said, to the, all the lives that are being claimed, but it's an expense I unfortunately can relate in that small ways that way. So this became from a perspective of closed exhibition all the way to understanding that closure had to be a way of life. And now in the spring of 2021, we're still hoovering with these um, experiences. Here in London, the museums are still closed and they'll still be closed for another month. So I, I am lucky 
to be able to actually see an exhibition about to open. And so from then on, what we decided to do was to gather most of the materials that I had been able to gather whilst I was working on the retrospective. First gave form to a book. The book was called The Anti-Museum that I co-edited together with Balthazar Love. And The Anti-Museum, that was just that. It was how we can think about the, um, the anti that that exhibition was. It was an anti-exhibition to do a retrospective or closed exhibition is to do exactly what exhibitions are not meant to be. Then namely, you cannot go in them anymore. You just uh, get to experience a facade. So we started to really experiment about all the fields that do define the institution, museums, art in general, and see how, if you think of them through the prism of the anti, we can start to define what an ideal museum can be, maybe, or we can actually see what the limits are, quite certainly. And so what, what happened is the um, anti-documentary become a a tool, maybe a reason, maybe an opportunity at the very least, to reflect upon the, um, what the book and the exhibitions were, was, and to, uh, to, yeah, to use a prospective outcome, to pr a prospective outlook. What does it mean to look forward from this moment, from these times, and also from the time that we live in? So what we decided to do was um, to invite Celine Fitzmaurice, who's a writer and producer, documentary producer based here in London, to work with me on the making of that documentary and really try to think how, in the scope of half an hour, we could tell that story, how we could tell this story mediated through the words as read by Henry Rollins to a music by F.M. Einheit. And this encapsulates the voices of so many others, namely, Henry Flint, Ben Vautier, Jack Villigley, Yoko Ono, Graziella Carnevale, Lydia Lange, Genesis Breyer Bioric, and many others who lent their voice to this understanding of what the anti can be, really trying to go beyond, beneath, abroad from this history that encompasses a history which is quite um, remarkable when one looks into that. And to jump back, the first closed exhibition happened in 1964 here in Tokyo at the Naika Gallery, closed by the hand of the High Red Center. So the documentary starts there and really explore through all these different gestures that encompasses the art of so many great artists, including Robert Barry, Daniel Buren, Graziella Carnevale. Lefebvre Jean-Claude, Maurizio Catalan, Santiago Sierra, Flamende Yanov and Svetlana Heger, and Maria Eichhorn. And all of these artists seizing the um, gesture of closure, Matsuzawa Yutaka, to make a work of art. How is it when you cannot experience a gallery anymore? And here we are in this paradoxical moment when we can experience a gallery, but to reflect upon what it means to be closed. And the anti museum and anti documentary is presented in a space which is in itself a maze, at least the look of a maze, in order that you have to walk around corridors of darkness to get there, as introduced by the painting by Philippe de Croza, who really literally took the structure of the gallery as realized for the exhibition as the motive for it to become in itself an anti museum or the painting of an anti museum. So to say, is the exhibition laid out flat, which becomes the um, pattern, the plan for the paintings to be. And the painting itself tells you where to go to that dead end, which is the film. A dead end, of course, metaphorically, as it opens up so much and so many thoughts and opportunities to really reflect and dream upon. Now, what is interesting is um, that retrospective outlook on a prospective experience that we all live in is exactly what we live in the second space of the MS Foundation. And that is here, if we look at an anti-museum on the one hand, 
and what it means, especially in the time we live in, how can we think today in terms of um, making an institution? How can we think today, when especially through the year that we have lived, or rather that we've lived indoors, how can we bring the outdoors indoors? How can we create or rather recreate an environment? Is an exhibition anything else but an environment in any case? And how can we think it's a new? And this led us to nurturing exhibitions, which is really what where we are now. And that is, what would it be to create an environment, but an environment that is not so much for us to live in, rather than an environment that watches leave, watches evolve around it. What are the responsive nature of us being in a given place, in a given museum, in a given gallery? What is this time from the, 20, from the end of April through to the middle of July? That time, that can happen. How can we render time? What is time but, if anything else, but in exhibitions and how can we accept the passing of time? And this was led us here to this exhibition, which is both an environment articulated in three points. The first point is the first thing we see is a tree. The tree comes from Fukuoka farm. And it was essential for us to begin there, really to think about how, if one stroke can ignite a revolution, can we look back at that revolution, especially in the time we live in, in that time of a great climate crisis, as expanded again, as revealed again by that global pandemic. A global pandemic has also been that of global climate change, of, the, of that great crisis which is the um, most urgent um, crisis we, fa we all face and how we, that we have to respond to. And back in the, um, in the 1970s, when Masa, Masanobu Fukuoka came with this um, the re the one through revolution, really sparkled what would, be, what would become as permaculture, this idea that no, we cannot keep on abusing the soil, the earth as we've been doing so far. So it felt extremely important to reflect back upon that radical gesture, that revolutionary gesture of just letting the earth be and letting the earth release take, take its toll from there. And this is what you see when you arrive. The actual soil that was the soil of the revolution being here brought into the gallery just for the time of the exhibition with a tree, an Amanatsu tree that grows in front of us or rather that is looking at, us, looking at us growing. It came from the farm, it is here for a little over two months, and then it will return to the farm. But in the meantime, it will be informed by the environment where we are here, which is an environment built by now Nishihara. So this environment literally built of structures built by now Nishihara, where you have six plinth where the speakers are, six benches as an invitation for us all to sit, and this planter in the middle, which become the host for the Fukuoka soil and tree coming here in the middle of the space as a celebration. This environment, it was extremely important which we started building and thinking about what it could become, that it too is of extremely natural, it's you know, is the if within the environment of the gallery, nature has been brought back here again with the logs, the log, the wooden log, the wooden log to sit on, the wooden log to host the planter, and the wooden log at where the speakers rest. And this environment echoes quite naturally and maybe very closely to that of the tree that we see growing. It also reminds us of the green desert as Reiko reminded me, where most of these trees come from, that the cycle of life is experienced here. And within all that is actually where we are bathed in, an environment bathed of the natural light, as seen through the most beautiful walls of the Hermes Foundation Gallery, but also an environment of sound. And it was a great honor that we could commission 
the American composer Phil Niblock six pieces for the for the bar exhibitions. As we've heard so often that music helps plants grow. Don't we heard that? Well, here we have that again. The music will create an environment. The music will be the bonding link. The most beautiful music, the most beautiful, profound compositions. All of this experience of the microtones, this experience of the music as you walk around, you know, the music for which the instrument played is a speaker. So to speak. The music played here is mission on symbol ear, David Marania, Stephen O'Malley, Deborah Walker, Elizabeth Smart, and the Japanese vocal group ensemble, Vox Humana. And each of them recorded. And these recordings became the basis for the work to be done, for the music to, be, to exist. These recordings become spliced and built up in the most beautiful and profound ways. Let us look into, especially for instance, and not as a matter of choice or not as a matter of um, one rather than another, but the most beautiful piece that we got to record again during the pandemic. And again, we did feel, what does it mean to bring singers together in one space to perform? So this is what we had the opportunity to do. And I'm very grateful to the Vox Mana Ensemble to have agreed to come and play Phil's most beautiful exploratory piece, Rhine version, Looking for Daniel. over and over again since it was composed in, back in 2019. And to have this new incarnation here again. But this is a piece that we will find quite often throughout the show as David Mania recorded another version too. But again, I was grateful for us to come back and to record a piece only for the voice here. I was very grateful for, again now, Anishihara to actually produce the piece in Japan for us and be there and manage the um, this very demanding um, moment. What does it mean to bring people together when people have to be kept apart again? And it was beautiful just to have the opportunity for us really to gather together, to get here, to come together and really create this music piece. I could think also of Stephen O'Malley, Poom piece, which was recorded right before the pandemic, coming to New York, recording at a Robert Post studio in New York, and uh, of course, even being from Sonho. And here we have him playing that most beautiful composition that Phil wrote with him. Again, what an opportunity we have here, Nazuma. So be here within the gallery, this environment made of sound music, the natural logs onto which we're invited to sit on to, as a plant grows in front of our eyes. The plant looking at us, responding to us, or us looking at expanding and being. This kind of double nature, the relationship between what it is to be looked at, what it is to be looking at, what is looking at, what it is to be looked at, what is the act of looking. What is that double relationship there, which is at stake? This invitation, nurturing exhibition, is really an invitation for us to live in an environment for us environment for us to be nurturing exhibitions really remind us that maybe the most fundamental lesson that we have learned during the pandemic is a great deal a great need for care we have to care for one another we're very fortunate when we can do that when others can do that for us and here we are in a moment when both the gallery cares for the, the plan, the plan cares for us, but we are in an environment that we keep on growing. So it's a temporary moment, an invitation for us to be, an invitation for us to live, and more than ever, an invitation for us to experience beauty, 
And I think this is where we are. So maybe let's go back to the beginning to conclude and think about exhibition curtains. Yes, there is that notion of curtains. Isn't it terrible? This, it is curtains. It is extracting. It is really dismantling. But also cutting brings life. That tree has been cut. Cut in order to grow. Cut in order to be nurtured. Cut in order to be expanded. We literally have an exhibition cut from its original place, the Kunstale in February. He re-envisaged the new within a film. We have all these different cuttings coming together. This cut tree reminds us of the ephemeral nature that exhibitions really are. The ephemeral nature, I guess, of any environment we get to live in. The ephemeral nature is an invitation for us to be.